Hey there everybody and welcome to this learn by doing tutorial for the board game Obsession designed by Dan Halligan. There are several ways you can use this video to learn the game. First, if you own the Obsession board game itself, you can watch and listen to this video while you play with the actual board game pieces. If that sounds like you, please set up your round track board to resemble this. Most notably, you'll be playing a solo game with the Simpson Solo card, so set out the Simpson Solitaire card, as well as the Solitaire Builders Market AI card, on top of or to the side of your round track board. Also, have the Charles and Elizabeth Fairchild cards nearby. Next, set up the supply board to look like this. Have all the other tiles from the base game of Obsession nearby, should you need to find a specific tile. You'll be playing as the Ponsonby family, so set up your Ponsonby family board to look like this. Finally, set up your starting hand of cards so it looks like this. Your starting hand should contain the four Ponsonby family member cards, as well as the two starting casual guests drawn randomly, in this case, Miss Anne Harlow and Major William Hawes. Place the remaining casual guest deck, as well as the prestige guest deck, face up nearby, so that you can find a particular guest card when you're instructed to do so. If you don't own the Obsession board game, or you prefer to learn the game while using your Windows computer, you can watch and listen to this video while you run version 2.0 or later of Obsession for Windows. If you'd like to find out how to download the program for free, click the link in the show notes for this video. If you've already installed Obsession for Windows version 2.0 or later, start the program, and in the setup screen, Click the Obsession Tutorial button. You can watch this video on your phone or other device as you run the program on your Windows computer. Alternatively, you can watch the video on the same computer that you're using to run Obsession for Windows. And if that's the case, and if you have two monitors, play the video on one monitor and run the program on the other. But if you only have one monitor, Continue watching the video on your computer, and when you're instructed to do so, minimize and listen to the video while you interact with the program. In this tutorial for the base game of Obsession, we'll be covering the rules of the game, but I won't be covering how you set up the game. Look in the show notes for a link to a separate video that will explain how you set up a game of Obsession. This short introductory chapter is specifically aimed at those of you who are running Obsession for Windows. Start the program, click the Obsession Tutorial button as I did in the Setup window, skip past the introductory screen by clicking OK as I just did a moment ago, and then, if necessary, minimize this video and listen to it while you're interacting with the program. If you're playing with the actual board game in front of you, just continue watching and follow along. What you're now looking at is a representation of your family board and player area. In the upper left corner, you can see the five main categories of estate tiles that you'll be collecting over the course of the game, as well as your five tiles that make up your starting country estate. There's the brown private study in the essentials column, the blue butler's room in the service column, the red main gazebo in the estate column, the purple front parlor in the prestige column, and the bowling green in the sporting column. As you can see, if you hover your mouse over any of these tiles, you'll see an enlarged view of both the front and back side of the tile that will appear in the corner of the screen. The front side in the enlarged view is on top, while the back side of the tile is shown on the bottom, and notice that the front side has a black border around it, indicating that you start the game with these five country estate tiles face up, so that the picture of the building can be seen in the upper right corner of each tile. 
The back side of each tile is a picture of a rose in the upper right corner. To the right of the bowling green is your reputation wheel. You normally start the game with the large one in the center and the small one in the upper right, covered with a black token or highlighted as shown. This represents your starting reputation. If you think of the reputation wheel as a clock, then your starting reputation is set to 10 minutes after 1. So sometimes I'll refer to this as a reputation of 1.1 or simply 1, since the important number is the large 1 in the center of the reputation wheel. Your reputation in the game can never fall below 1.1. Below the reputation wheel is a series of tokens representing your starting servants. I'm showing the Meeple's version of those servants, so I'm going to switch to the standard tokens. You can see that all five of your servants begin the game in the available service box. You start the game with a blue butler, a red housekeeper, a green valet, a purple lady's maid, and a white footman. If you ever forget which is which, simply hover your mouse over the servant, and a little tooltip will pop up and remind you. To the right of the reputation wheel is the amount of money you currently hold in pounds. Normally you start the game with zero pounds, but we're playing as the Ponsonby family, and the Ponsonby's special ability is that they start the game with 300 pounds. Finally, along the bottom of the screen is your starting hand of cards. You begin the game with your four family members and two randomly dealt starting casual guests. If you hover your mouse over a card, you'll see an enlarged view of the card in the corner of the screen. In the case of the Ponsonby's, your four family members consist of the father, Theodore, Earl of Ponsonby, his wife, Mabel, Countess of Ponsonby, their daughter, Lady Margaret Carlo, and their son, Edward, Viscount Dorchester. As I said, you were also randomly dealt two starting casual guests who happened to be Miss Anne Harlow and Major William Hawes. Starting casual guests can be identified by the crown icon in the upper left corner of the card. I now want to turn your attention to the all-important order of play that appears on your family board. To view the family board at this point, click the paused button that is sitting in the sporting column heading. You're now looking at the Ponsonby family board. The order of play is your Bible when it comes to executing the steps of your turn correctly and completely. The first step in every turn of obsession involves rotating service. Because you're just starting the game and all your servants are in the available service box, you can skip this step when it's your first turn. But in future turns, when it's time to rotate service, you'll first move all servants and servants' quarters to available service, and then you'll move all your servants in expended service over to servants' quarters. Notice that step two in the order of play mentions the round track, monuments, and the servants hall. I'll be touching on this step later on, but for now you can safely skip past it. Steps three through six make up the main part of your turn, and we'll be going over these in detail multiple times over the course of this tutorial. In step seven, you can spend some of your hard-earned money to purchase a tile from the builder's market to improve your country estate. That's why the tiles in your country estate are also referred to as improvement tiles. Finally, in step eight, you'll clear the board and perform some cleanup steps. We'll be covering both of these steps in detail as well, so for now, click anywhere on the family board to return to the main screen. When you're ready to begin your turn, and after you've rotated service if need be, you'll host one of the activity tiles in your country estate and move it to the activity box. Let's say we'd like to host a game of bowls in the Bowling Green. Go ahead and click on the Bowling Green tile in your country estate to move it to the activity box. 
If you're watching this video with the board game pieces in front of you, do the same thing and move your bowling green tile to the activity box on your family board. You're allowed to host this activity because its prestige rating of 1, the large number in the bottom left corner of the tile, is less than or equal to your family's reputation, which is the big 1 in the center of your reputation wheel. There are a few things you should take note of now. In order to properly host this activity, two gentry need to be invited to the activity. Gentry refers to any two people in your hand of cards which have a prestige rating equal to or below your family's reputation. The picture of the white footman tells you that the footman needs to be in attendance in order to host this activity. If you successfully host the activity, it will produce 300 pounds for you. That's referred to as the activity's favor. Finally, notice that the tile itself is worth negative three victory points to you at present. All right, let's start by lining up the necessary servant for the activity. Find the white footman in available service, click and drag him onto the bowling green tile in the activity box. Similarly, move the white footman onto the tile if you have the board game set up in front of you. Now that the activity is properly staffed, let's invite two people to play a game of bowls. Find your daughter, Lady Margaret Carlo. She's the third card in your hand. And click her with your mouse to invite her to the activity. If you're playing with the actual board game, remove Lady Margaret Carlo from your hand and place her face up in front of you. Your family members can attend most of the activities you'll we'll be hosting. You'll find the family crest shown in the upper left corner of all family cards. We need to invite a second guest. Let's invite Major William Hawes, the last card in your hand. His prestige rating of 1, the large number in the upper left corner of this card, is less than or equal to your family's reputation of 1 and therefore he's eligible to attend this activity. Now that we have two people to play bowls on the bowling green, we need to ensure that they're properly attended to as well. Fortunately, family members are very much at home, in and around their estate, so they're never in need of a servant to attend them at an activity. But you'll often find that invited female guests require the help of a purple lady's maid, while invited male guests frequently require the help of a green valet. Since Lady Margaret wrote to the Major and asked him to join her for a game of bowls this afternoon, we need to provide the Major with a green valet to attend to his needs, as indicated by the image of the green valet in the bottom left corner of his card. Drag and drop the green valet in available service on top of Major William Hawes or use the actual board game pieces in front of you. We're ready to go. The Bowling Green activity is being attended to by a footman. Two gentry have been invited to play bowls on the green, and the male guest, Major William Hawes, has the requisite green valid in attendance. Over the course of their playing bowls on the green, Lady Margaret will learn of an investment in a French company that will ultimately add 300 pounds to her family's coffers. Well, that's one explanation of the 300 pound favor denoted on the bowling green tile. Also notice the two lion rampants in the bottom right corner of Major Haw's card. They signify that his favor for playing bowls on the ground of your estate will raise your reputation by two steps. That means the marker on the small one on your reputation wheel will shift clockwise two steps, and your reputation will increase from 1.1 to 1.3, or half past one if you wish. For all intents and purposes, your family's reputation will be one, but you'll be two steps closer to increasing your family's reputation to two. Lastly, check out the icons on the bottom right corner of Lady Margaret's card. The single floor de lis signifies that a new casual guest will visit the estate and be added to your hand, perhaps someone that was introduced to her by Major Hawes. 
it's possible we might invite this new casual guest to an activity at some point in the future. By the way, casual guests always have a prestige rating of 1 or 2, as shown in the upper left corner of the card, while prestige guests, who are shuffled into a separate pile of cards, have a prestige rating of 3 or higher. They're denoted by the appearance of two floors de lis side by side. There are also two lion rampants in the bottom right corner of Lady Margaret's card, but there's an asterisk next to them. If you hover over the card, you'll see that the extra increase of two reputation is an admirer bonus that can only be earned when a male prestige guest is invited to the activity. Unfortunately, Major Hawes, while being a very nice man, does not come with any prestige riding on his coattails. He's simply a casual guest with a prestige rating of one, so Lady Margaret's admirer bonus of two reputation will not apply in this case. All right, let's get this party started. Click the Continue button. If you did everything correctly, the first thing that should happen is that you'll collect any money that's due you. Remember the Bowling Green Activity Tile produces 300 pounds, so our bank balance doubles from our starting balance of 300 pounds to 600 pounds. And if you're using the actual board game, go ahead and take an additional 300 pounds from the supply and add it to your starting money, so you should have 600 pounds in front of you now. By the way, if you ever make a mistake and you're using the program and you fall out of sync with this video, click the Undo button until you're back in sync. If you're using this program, click the pause button to continue. And the net amount of reputation gained or lost as a result of the activity will be recorded. In this case, you should see your reputation increase to 1.3, courtesy of Major Hawes to reputation favor. Finally, we expect a new casual guest to show up at the door thanks to Lady Margaret. Once again, click the paused button to find out who it is. Why, it's Miss Penelope Hill. As you can see, she has a family who is very well connected in London society. Notice that Miss Hill has a prestige rating of 2 in the upper left corner of her card. As a result, we won't be able to invite Miss Hill to an activity until our family reputation has risen to at least 2. When we do invite her to an activity, she'll need to be attended to by a lady's maid, and she'll introduce us to a new prestige guest, as denoted by the two floors de lis in the bottom right corner of her card. The one in the upper right corner means that Miss Penelope is worth one victory point to us as long as she's still in our hand or discard pile at the end of the game. Now that the activity is complete, Click the pause button and you'll have the opportunity to improve your country estate. You're now viewing a portion of the supply board that shows you the builder's market. This is a series of six tiles available for purchase upon the completion of your turn. While there are exceptions, generally speaking, you may only purchase one tile from the builder's market during step seven of your turn. The cost to purchase any individual tile is the sum of the value pre-printed on the board next to the tile, plus or minus a cost modification value that may appear in the upper right corner of the improvement tile itself. Consider the blue brushing room service tile in the 300 pound slot as an example. The pre-printed cost is 300 pounds but there's a cost modification on the tile itself of minus 200 pounds. So it would only cost us 300 less 200 or 100 pounds to add the brushing room to our estate. The brushing room itself is not an activity tile. Instead, like many blue service tiles, it provides its owner with a special ability, as indicated by the circular arrows. As you can see, if this tile is part of your country estate, footmen on staff would be trained to serve as valets when needed. That means if you needed a valet to attend to a guest, for example, but you had no valets in available service, either because they were assigned to other guests or they were fast asleep in servants' quarters, 
Well, if you did have a white footman in available service, that footman could then stand in and act as a valet to fulfill that need. That's a handy ability to have, so go ahead and click the brushing room to purchase it. The £100 cost should automatically be deducted and returned to the supply, and the brushing room improvement tile will be added to the blue service column in your country estate. If you're for playing with the board game pieces, please follow along. The builder's market then replenishes. All the tiles that were to the right of the slot where the brushing room used to be shift to the left to fill in the gap. A new tile is then drawn at random from the bag. In our case, that new tile is the blue servant's quarters tile. We'll talk more about this tile shortly, but for now, click the paused button to continue. We've now entered the final step in the order of play, the cleanup step. The first thing that's going to happen is that all the servants that were assigned to the activity and or to the invited guests will be moved to expended service. In our case, the white footman on the bowling green and the green valet on Major William Hawes will be moved to expended service and will be unavailable to us for one full turn. Managing your servants so that you have the servants you need to attend to the activities you want to host is a key part of the game of Obsession. Click the pause button to see the footman and valet move to expended service. Next, all invited guests will leave your hand and will be added to your discard pile. They won't return to your hand until you pass your turn sometime later in the game. Click the pause button to make this happen. The discard pile is the pink colored box below expended service. You can click any of the names in this list at any time to view the respective cards. The last thing that happens in this final step in the order of play is that the current activity tile will flip if the image of the rose is not currently face up. If the activity tile was previously flipped and its rose is currently face up, the tile will not flip again. The tile is then returned to your country estate with the row side face up. In our case, the bowling green will flip. Click the pause button to return the bowling green to your country estate. Notice that the rose is now face up, indicating that the back side of the tile is face up. Remember how the bowling green used to be worth negative three victory points? Look again. Its new victory point value is positive two points, a gain of five victory points. Notice that you can still host a game of bowls for two gentry using this tile on a future turn, but now it will only pay out 200 pounds. And since the tile won't flip again, you won't gain any additional victory points for using it an additional time. Since we're playing a solo game in this tutorial, it's now time to roll the 20-sided die to see which tile the game will remove from the Builder's Market. Click the End Turn button to proceed. Both the round track and the Builder's Market should now be visible. You'll notice that the round one space of the round track has a black border around it. If you're playing with the board game pieces, you probably have a token on round one. Also, check out the Solitaire Builder's Market AI card on the far right. Because there is no tile currently visible in the Builder's Market that's labeled as a monument, if a 1 to 4 is rolled on the 20-sided die, the game will remove the tennis court from position 1. If a 5 to 7 is rolled, the breakfast room in position 2 will be removed. On a roll of 8 to 10, you'll be deprived of the hillside kennels. If 11 to 12 comes up, the north dining room will disappear. On a roll of 13 to 14, the green room in slot 5 will vanish. On a roll of 15, the 6 tile in the market, servants' quarters, will be pulled. Should a 16 to 19 come up on the die, no tile will be removed. And finally, in the event a 20 is rolled, all tiles in the builder's market will be set aside, 
a new set of six tiles will be drawn and sorted in ascending order by their tile sorting number to form a new builder's market. The tile sorting number is the small number next to the victory points in the lower right corner. So when the entire builder's market is refreshed, the lowest tile sorting number tile will be in the far left, and the tile with the highest sorting number will be in the far right. Afterwards, the original six tiles will be shuffled back into the bag. Also, in the event that 16 to 20 is rolled, when the die is rolled again following your next turn in round two, the value of the die will automatically be reduced by five to ensure that a tile is definitely removed from the builder's market next round. Click continue to roll the die. A six turned up, so the breakfast room in slot two was removed. Then, all the tiles to the right of slot 2 slid left to fill in the gap, and a new tile was drawn from the bag, and what do you know? The other breakfast room has now shown up in the 800-pound slot. While many of the tiles in the bag are unique, there are two copies of other tiles, and the breakfast room happens to be one of them. Click Continue to hide the builder's market. Before the round track goes away, I want you to notice something coming up in round three. It's the village fair. You might notice that there are two village fairs in the game, one that shows up in round three, while the other one makes an appearance in round nine. That upcoming village fair is going to direct what we're about to do in our next turn, so I wanted you to be aware of it. When you click continue to proceed, Notice what happens at the start of round two. The first step in the order of play that has us rotate service is automatically executed by the program. While there are no servants in servants' quarters to move into available service, there is the valet and the footman in expended service, and they will leave expended service and move into servants' quarters. At the start of round three, those two servants will leave servants' quarters and return to available service when they'll be available to us for use once again. If you haven't already done so, click Continue to begin round two and rotate your service. The valet and the footman should now be in servants' quarters, where they're resting, so they'll be ready and able to be called on in a future turn in round three or later. But now it's only round two. With a village fair coming up next round, we might want to prepare for it. This is entirely optional, but it is an activity you can host if you wish. Let's do that in round two. Click the brown private study in the essentials column of your country estate to move it to the activity box. You'll see that the activity tile is village fair planning. Two members of the family must be present to plan for the village fair and the blue butler will also have to be on hand to assist. Drag the blue butler from available service and drop it on top of the private study. There are three family members remaining in our hands since Lady Margaret Carlo is currently in the discard pile. To plan for the village fair, let's have the patriarch and the matriarch of the family meet in the private study. Click Theodore, the first card in your hand, and click his wife, Mabel, the second card in your hand, to invite them to the activity. Or take those two cards out of your hand and place them in front of you if you're playing with the cards. Because they're family members, no additional servants are necessary. All right, you're probably asking, just what is this village fair that happens twice during the game, and why might we want to spend a turn planning for it? Hover your mouse over the private study to find out. When the village fair occurs in rounds three and nine, at the start of the round, all players who have flipped their private study tile will automatically earn 300 pounds and two steps of reputation. But there's a price to pay for this nice bonus. You'll see that the face-up side of the private study indicates that the tile is currently worth three victory points at the end of the game. But if the tile has been flipped, its value drops to zero victory points. So in effect, you're paying three victory points to gain a total of 600 pounds and four steps of reputation over the course of the game if you decide to host this activity. 
And as an aside, if you happen to be playing the extended game of Obsession that plays over 20 rounds instead of the normal game 16 rounds, there are three village fairs in that game, so the payoff in exchange for those three victory points is 900 pounds and six steps of reputation. Before clicking continue, check out the favors that are coming your way. Theodore will come up with a plan that nets the family 200 pounds, maybe from an oil deal he arranges with visiting Saudi Arabian dignitaries. The Countess will offer us a choice. Her favor lets you either draw two casual guests and choose one to keep, discarding the other to the bottom of the casual guest deck, or she allows you to dismiss a casual guest from your hand or discard pile and send it to the bottom of the casual guest deck. Why would you want to dismiss a guest? That question will be answered in just a few seconds. Click Continue to proceed. First, you'll see that you've gained 200 pounds courtesy of the Earl, and the family's balance now stands at 700 pounds. The program is now asking whether you want to draw two casual guests and keep one, or to dismiss a guest. We have no one we want to dismiss at this time, so click the first option, draw two casual guests, and keep one. Now you can see the two cards that were drawn from the top of the casual guest deck. Anne Hawkins is an American heiress, and she provides a favor of 800 pounds, but she also comes with a negative favor. She knocks your reputation down by three steps. Furthermore, she deducts three victory points from your score at the end of the game if she's still hanging around. The other option we can choose from is Thomas Handel Esquire, who brings two new casual guests to the front door, and he's worth zero victory points. Notice that both guests have a prestige rating of one, so either one can be put to use right away. We're going to choose to add Anne Hawkins to our hand, so go ahead and select her. If you made a mistake and click Thomas Handle, remember, click the Undo button in the top right corner to get back in sync with the tutorial. I'm now clicking Ann Hawkins and she'll be added to our hand, and Thomas Handle will go to the bottom of the casual guest deck. We'll have to remember to use Mabel's Dismiss Favor before the end of the game to kick Miss Hawkins out the back door and have her return to the States with all that money in tow. That way we won't have that negative three victory points hurt our score. Once again, we can purchase a tile from the Builder's Market. That Servant's Quarters tile is very enticing. It happens to be designer Dan Halligan's favorite tile on the game, and for a good reason. The Servant's Quarters service tile lets you deploy one servant from Servant's Quarters during each turn, as if it were sitting in available service. That essentially lets you make use of a servant you wouldn't normally have access to once per turn. Unfortunately, the current cost of the Servant's Quarters is 700 pounds plus 100 pounds, or 800 pounds, which is 100 pounds out of reach given our current balance of 700 pounds. But what the heck, this is a tutorial, so let's explore other options. Click the small SA button to the left of the discard pile to view the special actions that are always available to you when you play Obsession. If you're playing with the actual board game, you'll find the special actions listed right on your family board next to the order of play. At any time during the game, you can trade in two steps of reputation in exchange for 100 pounds. Also, you have the option of spending three steps of reputation should you ever need to refresh a servant, essentially waking him or her up from a sound sleep, but you'll have to spend three steps of reputation to do that. You might be desperate to have that service ready to be put to work for the activity that you're currently hosting. Finally, you can pay four steps of reputation to refresh the Builder's Market. That is, remove all the tiles from the Builder's Market, draw and sort six new tiles from the bag to form a new Builder's Market, and shuffle the original tiles back into the bag. We are now going to make use of the first option. 
Maybe it's not the smartest play, but like I said, this is a tutorial, so we're going to go for broke. Right click the 700 pounds to the right of your reputation wheel. The two notches of reputation from William Hawes will go away. Your reputation will return to its starting point of 1.1 and you'll automatically have 100 pounds added to your balance. Remember, right click the money, not left click. By the way, if you ever needed to refresh a servant in exchange for three reputation, you would right click the servant in the servant's quarters box to do that. It won't work now because we don't have three reputation to spend. We're about to click on the servant's quarters tile on the builder's market to purchase it for 800 pounds, but I want you to take note of what happens afterwards when the builder's market is replenished. The breakfast room will slide to the left to fill in the hole in the 700 pound slot left by the servant's quarters. The next tile that's going to be drawn from the bag will be another hillside kennels. Well, because that tile is already present in the 400 pound slot of the builder's market, the second copy will be stacked on top of the first copy, and another tile will be drawn to fill in the 800 pound slot. At no time when you're playing Obsession should you have two tiles that are the same occupying two different slots in the builder's market. I'm going to click the servants tile now to purchase it. Notice that the hillside kennels now has two copies of it stacked in the 400 pound slot and the queen suite was drawn from the bag to fill in the 800 pound slot. Next, as usual, the butler will be sent to expended service, the Mr. and Mrs. will make their way to the discard pile, and the private study will flip to its row side and return to the essentials column. You won't be able to use the private study a second time because there is no hostable activity shown on the back side of the tile. Click the pause button to complete the cleanup step now. Next, Click End Turn and the AI will roll a die and remove a tile from the builder's market. A one was rolled and the tennis court goes away. It's now round three and time for the village fair. Because we flipped our private study and prepared for the village fair in our last turn, we're now entitled to gain two steps of reputation and 300 pounds. Click the pause button to continue. Let's explore the other starting tiles and begin to develop our country estate with new and more advanced improvement tiles that you can use as your reputation improves. This time, click the main gazebo to move it to the activity box. We're going to hold an afternoon tea. This activity also requires a white footman and two gentry. Its favor is a new prestige guest added to your hand, as indicated by the appearance of the two floors de lis. Remember, one floor de lis represents a guest drawn from the casual guest deck, while two floors de lis represent a guest drawn from the prestige guest deck. Now drag and drop the white footman on top of the main gazebo. Let's have Edward, the Ponsonby son, the first card in your hand, join the American, Anne Hawkins, the fourth card in your hand, for tea in the main gazebo. You'll now need to drag your purple lady's maid onto Anne Hawkins. In addition to the prestige guests provided by the main gazebo, Edward provides a favor of either 100 pounds or one reputation. Anne Hawkins, on the other hand, provides a favor of 800 pounds and a loss of three reputation. Because our reputation currently stands at 1.3, this is a good time to invite Anne Hawkins to an activity. She'll have us take a hit to our reputation, but because we can only lose at most two reputation, the damage won't be quite as bad. Remember, your reputation can never fall below 1.1. 1 .1.
This also means that it's in our best interest to have Edward gain 100 pounds instead of one reputation. If we were to select his reputation favor instead, well then we would lose an amount of reputation equal to Anne Hawkins' negative 3 plus Edward's positive 1 reputation for a net loss of 2 reputation, and after losing 2 reputation we'd still end up with a reputation of 1.1, but we'd be 100 pounds poor because we mistakenly took the reputation favor from Edward instead of his 100 pounds. Click Continue. We're going to click the 100 pounds option for Edward, but first let's summarize what's about to happen. You always gain the net amount of money first, so our balance should increase by 900 pounds and grow to a handsome total of 1200 pounds. That's 100 pounds from Edward plus 800 pounds from Ann Hawkins. After you resolve the money favor, you then gain or lose the net amount of reputation. We'll only have to lose two reputation from Ann Hawkins instead of three as our reputation will bottom out at 1.1. Thirdly, you resolve guest favors. It will be at this point that we'll have a new prestige guest join our hand thanks to the main gazebo. Finally, if there were any other favors other than money, reputation, and guests, you would resolve those last. We're ready to proceed. This time the program won't pause between favors. Click the 100 pound option for Edward to continue. As expected, our money has grown to 1,200 pounds, our reputation is back at 1.1, and our new prestige guest is Richard, Duke of Longford. He has a prestige rating of 6, so we're not going to be able to make use of him for some time to come. In the builder's market, the hillside kennels, the north dining room, or the green room might all be a good choice. The green room is worth taking a closer look at. If you hover over it, you'll see that the back side is a different color, and it doesn't display a rose in the upper right corner. That's because the green room is an example of a hybrid tile. It flips every single time you host its activity. So when you use it to host a philanthropy meeting, it flips to its prestige side and returns to your country estate in the purple prestige column. Should you then host a dramatic performance in a future round, it will flip back to the essential side and change columns once again. There's a reason why you might want to play with a tile like that, and I'll touch on that point later on in this tutorial. If you're ever playing with a hybrid tile in the game, its starting side is the side that has the underscore underneath the icon in the upper right corner. For now, we're going to purchase the cheaper hillside kennels. Because there are two hillside kennels tiles in the slot, the builder's market won't have to refill afterwards. And let me make a note right now and say that you can never have two of the same tile in your country estate. So once we purchase this hillside kennels, we're not going to be allowed to purchase the other copy. And notice that just because our family reputation currently stands at one, that doesn't prevent us from purchasing an improvement tile with a higher prestige rating. In fact, you're encouraged to do so. It just means that we won't be able to host this more advanced activity until our family reputation grows high enough. I've now purchased the Hillside Kennels. Our bank balance is now 900 pounds and the Hillside Kennels has been added to our country estate. Check out the backside of the flipped main gazebo to see that it's now worth positive two victory points instead of the negative two victory points that was shown on the front side. And while you can host another afternoon tea, you won't be able to gain another prestige guest from the main gazebo because its backside favor now indicates that you draw two casual guests, choose one to keep, and discard the other to the bottom of the casual guest deck. Well, sadly, we haven't been doing too well as far as reputation is concerned, and I take full responsibility for that, but I am trying to teach you all the ins and outs of the game, so bear with me. 
Despite our flagging reputation, we should still try to develop our country estate in an effort to avoid reusing flipped tiles down the road. By purchasing and hosting new activity tiles, eventually we'll be able to flip those tiles and further improve our victory point tally. Remember, when you reuse a flip tile with its row side already face up, it doesn't flip again, and you don't earn any new victory points. Hybrid tiles are the exception to that rule. When our family reputation eventually makes it to two, meaning when we gain a total of five steps of reputation and the marker moves all the way around the wheel and then moves beyond the five spot back to the one spot, We'll flip the center counter in the reputation wheel from 1 to 2. It's at that point we'll be able to host activities with a prestige rating of 2. Therefore, at some point, we should aim to try and get that breakfast room from the builder's market. If the game doesn't steal it first. There's no point in spending 600 pounds for it now. Odds are the AI will take another market from the display we hope, and if we wait, the breakfast room will become cheaper over time. If you're really paying attention, you'll notice that we got ourselves into a jam. Oh, okay, I got ourselves into a jam. Our family reputation is still at one, but we only have one guest with a prestige rating of one available to us. We'll have to deal with that problem later on. Anyway, let's end our turn and let the AI remove a card from the market. A three is rolled on the 20-sided die and the other hillside kennels leaves the market. The game has been paused again and the round track has been displayed to point out the next special event. It's round four and time for a courtship. If you're listening to this video and it's minimized on your screen, I recommend you restore it to a window now so that you can watch this portion of the video to better understand what I'm going to be talking about. When you play Obsession, there are four courtships that occur at four or five round intervals depending on whether you're playing a regular game or an extended game. In the case of our standard game here, there's a courtship that occurs in rounds four, eight, twelve, and the last round of the game, 16. Courtships occur at the end of each season of play, so in a regular game, rounds 1 to 4 represent the first season, rounds 5 to 8 the second season, rounds 9 to 12 the third season, and rounds 13 to 16 the fourth and final season. Courtship rounds work differently than other rounds. In a courtship round, players don't take turns hosting activities. Instead, all families vie for the attention of Charles and Elizabeth Fairchild in hopes of forming an attachment with the wealthy and influential Fairchild family. The game starts with a theme deck of 10 shuffled cards. The theme deck consists of two cards for each of the five categories of tiles, two essentials cards, two service cards, two estate cards, two prestige cards, and two sporting theme cards. The theme represents the aspect of your estate that the Fairchilds are using to measure your family's position in British society, and perhaps more importantly, whether your son or daughter may be of romantic interest to them. If the current victory point total of your column of tiles in the selected theme is higher than all other players, you'll earn the right to have a fair child join your hand for the next season, and as a bonus, you'll also gain a victory point card. I'll talk more about VP cards in a little bit. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose the current theme for this courtship round was service. If we look at our service column and total up the victory points for the tiles in that column, we would arrive at one plus zero, plus one, for a total of two. If every other player had a total number of service victory points that was less than two, well then we'd win the courtship. We would choose to add either Charles or Elizabeth to our hand for use in the next season only. 
that is the next three rounds of play. And we'd also draw a victory point card to keep hidden in our player area. In the event of a tie, if one or two other players, for example, also had a total number of victory points of two in the service column, well then no player would add a fair child to their hand, but each tied player would still gain a VP card. If you do win the courtship and add a fair child to your hand, you play with them for the next three rounds only. You have to return them to the round track board just prior to resolving the next courtship. In our solo game, we're playing against the Simpson family. In the first season's courtship, meaning when you're resolving the first courtship in round four, you can see from the Simpsons card that if Essentials or Service was the selected theme, you would assume their victory point total was zero and compare that total to yours in the respective column. On the other hand, if Estate was the selected theme, you would assume that the, the Simpsons total was negative two. You can see that the Simpson family places a lot of importance on the prestige category early on. In that category, their victory point total is assumed to be seven for purposes of the first courtship. And if the sporting theme was pulled, well, then in that case, you would assume their victory point total was one. There are three ways to play Obsession. In an open courtship, the theme card is revealed at the start of each season, meaning at the start of rounds 1, 5, 9, and 13 in a regular game of Obsession. That way, all players know which theme the Fairchilds are going to be using to evaluate their family, and the race is on to enhance your estate in such a way that your victory point total in the selected category is better than that of all other players. On the other hand, in a closed courtship, the theme card won't be revealed until just before each courtship is resolved. In a closed courtship, you don't know how you'll be evaluated, and therefore you might try to stay ahead in victory points in as many categories as possible. In a random courtship, the third way to play Obsession, the 20-sided die is rolled at the start of every season to determine when the theme card will be revealed. Should you roll a 1 to 5 in round 1, you would reveal the theme card immediately, just as if you were playing an open courtship for that season. If you rolled 6 to 10, you'd reveal the theme card at the start of round 2. On a roll of 11 to 15, you revealed the theme card at the start of round 3. And on a roll of 16 to 20, you would reveal the theme card in round 4 just before resolving the courtship. So in that case, you'd be playing a closed courtship for the first season. After you resolve the courtship in round four, you would roll the 20-sided die again to determine the timing of the reveal of the next theme card for the upcoming season. When you're playing a solo game as we are now, you always play with a closed courtship. That's because you have the advantage of knowing how strong your solo opponent is in each of the five categories. A closed courtship is also a good idea when playing with players who are new to Obsession. It allows them to focus on learning the intricacies of the game without being distracted by the theme card and having to worry about the upcoming courtship. Once all players are comfortable with the game, you might then try to play with an open or a random courtship. Open courtships and hybrid tiles are perfect for each other, by the way. Should you need to quickly get more points in one column versus another, you can always host a suitable hybrid tile and have it switch columns to improve your chances of winning the courtship. That's the advantage sometimes of having hybrid tiles in your estate. Let's see how we stack up against the Simpson family in each of the five categories. Remember, the Simpsons will be using a total of 0, 0, minus 2, 7, and 1 victory points in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th categories, respectively. Fortunately, my Obsession program keeps a running tally of how well you're doing in the case of each category. If I switch back to the main screen now, you can see that our current total in Essentials is 0, just like the Simpson family.
and therefore we're tied with them in essentials. In service, we're two points ahead of their total of zero victory points. In the estate category, we're four points ahead, given our positive two against their negative two victory points. In prestige, we're nine points behind when you compare our negative two victory points to their positive seven. And finally, we're also tied in the sporting column with our total of one victory point compared to their one victory point in that category. The final core chip in the last round of the game is treated differently. In that core chip, you calculate the total of your victory points across all four revealed themes and compare that grand total with your opponent's corresponding grand total. So if it were now the last round of the game and the four revealed theme cards over the course of the game, say, were service, prestige, service, and estate, we would add up two for service, minus two for prestige, another positive two for service because two of the drawn theme cards were service cards, and finally plus two for estate for a grand total of two minus two plus two plus two or four. When you add a fair child to your hand in the final round of the game, you don't have the benefit of using that fair child in a future activity because the game is over. You do, however, get to add their eight victory points to your final score. It doesn't matter which fair child you have in your hand at the end of the game. They both add eight victory points to your final total. Okay, if necessary, go ahead and minimize the video again and listen to it while you return your attention to the game at hand. And click continue to reveal the first theme card to see how we measured up. It's a state. We win the courtship with a score of 2 versus minus 2. We gain a victory point card, and we get to choose whether we want to add Charles or Elizabeth to our hand for the upcoming season. Charles and Elizabeth's favors are somewhat different. Charles offers a favor of three reputation, while Elizabeth offers a favor of one prestige guest and two reputation. Well, I'd say most of the time Elizabeth's prestige guest gives her the slight advantage, but in our case, we need all the reputation we can get. Remember, because Charles has treated it as a prestige guest, but with a prestige rating of one, if we can pair him up with our family daughter, Lady Margaret, at an activity, we'll also gain her admirer bonus of two reputation. So between those two cards, that would be a gain of five reputation in one round. So we're going to click Charles and have him added to our hand. By the way, that VP card we were dealt is worth five victory points at the end of the game but you can redeem it instead at any time in order to refresh the builder's market for free, in which case you would give up the five victory points, so I guess it's not free. For that reason, think twice before you decide to redeem a victory point card for its effect rather than for its endgame victory points. The game is paused because one more thing has to happen at the end of each courtship round. Each player must discard one of their secret objective cards. At the start of a regular game of Obsession, you're dealt a hidden hand of five objective cards. At the start of round six, each player will be dealt two new objective cards. Since you start the game with five objective cards, you discard one at the completion of every courtship and you gain an additional two in round six. That means you're going to end the game with five less four plus two or three objective cards. Well, that's assuming you don't own and host the one special tile that provides you with one extra objective card, that one being the main library. Objective cards are endgame scoring cards. When using Obsession for Windows, you can toggle the view to see your objective cards by clicking the Objectives button. 
You can see that at the end of the game, you will score an additional 12 victory points if you happen to have the Gable Conservatory and one library in your country estate at that time. Your second objective card provides 5 victory points if you end the game with the French Garden. You'll score 6 victory points if you end the game with 3 or more ladies' maids. You can score a whopping 17 victory points if you end the game with the Billiards Room, the Hillside Kennels, and the Cabinet of Curiosities. And finally, you can score 9 victory points if you end the game with a Breakfast Room and a North Dining Room. Two tiles, if you recall, that happen to be sitting in the Builder's Market at this very moment. Hint, hint. We now have to choose one objective card to discard to the bottom of the objective deck. Let's get rid of the second one, the one that scores five victory points for having the French Garden. There's no telling whether the French Garden is ever going to show up in the Builder's Market. And honestly, it's only worth five victory points, so I think that's one we can easily get rid of. Go ahead and click Continue. Let the program ask which objective card you wish to discard, and choose to discard the French Garden, the second one. Incidentally, objective cards, VP cards, and technically your hand of cards are the only hidden information in the game. Everything else is public knowledge, including what cards you draw from the casual and prestige guest decks. Whenever you draw a card from either of those decks, you're obligated to announce what you drew to all other players in the game. It's about to be round five, and something else is going to happen at the start of that round the service tile reserve will be created. Any and all blue service tiles in the builder's market will be moved to the supply board and stacked in the service tile reserve space on the far left. The builder's market will then refill as necessary. Should you ever draw another service tile from the bag, that service tile will immediately be moved to the service tile reserve stack on the supply board and you would draw again. This guarantees that the builder's market won't be clogged with blue service tiles from round 5 onward. You can see that something similar happens at the start of round 9 when the PR1 tile reserve is set up. At that time, any tiles in the builder's market with a prestige rating of 1 will be moved to the supply board and stacked in the prestige rating 1 space. And you would draw again. The builder's market will then refill as necessary, and should you ever draw another tile from the bag with a prestige rating of 1, that tile will immediately be moved to the prestige rating 1 stack, and you would draw again. That guarantees that the Builder's Market won't be clogged with Prestige Rating 1 tiles from Round 9 onward. For now, the only service tile in the Builder's Market is the Butler's Pantry. This tile is about to be moved to the Service Tile Reserve Stack, shown here in my mini version of the Builder's Market. When choosing to purchase a tile from the Builder's Market, you can always buy a tile from either the Service Tile Reserve Stack or the Prestige Rating 1 Stack at a cost of £300, plus or minus any cost modification that might be depicted in the upper right corner of the tile. As a result, the Butler's Pantry is suddenly going to be a lot cheaper to buy. Click Continue now to have the program create the Service Tile Reserve Stack. Let's go back to the Builder's Market for a second. Well, as it turns out, when the Butler's Pantry was moved to the Service Tile Reserve Stack, another blue Service Tile was drawn and also moved to the Service Tile Reserve Stack. That was the Servants' Hall. Finally, the smoking room was drawn, and that filled the 800-pound slot. I'll talk more about the butler's pantry and the servants' hall when we revisit the builder's market near the end of this round. In the meantime, it's round five, and our options are non-existent. We can't play the private study. 
We can't host another afternoon tea in the main gazebo or a game of bowls in the bowling green because both of those tiles require a footman and two gentry, and the only gentry we could play right now are Charles Fairchild, remember he has a prestige rating of one, and Anne Harlow with her prestige rating of one. We do have the servants' quarters, which lets us wake up one servant in servants' quarters, but we need both servants in servants' quarters, the lady's maid and the footman. Similarly, we can't play whist in the front parlor because that tile requires a housekeeper and two ladies, and we don't have two ladies in our hand to play. It is worth noting, by the way, that one of the benefits of the housekeeper is that she can stand in for a lady's maid when there are no lady's maids available. Well, that's similar to how the footman works when you own the brushing room tile, but you don't need to have a special service tile in order to get this extra benefit of the housekeeper. Even so, we can't play the front parlor because we only own one housekeeper and one lady's maid, and we only have one female guest in our hand that's playable. If we had chosen Elizabeth Fairchild over Charles in the last courtship, we wouldn't have been better off. We'd still have to play Elizabeth and Anne Harlow, and both of those cards require a lady's maid. And with our one and only lady's maid and footman in servants' quarters, there's nothing we can do at this point except pass. Therefore, we're going to click the Pass button. When you pass, all of the cards in your discard pile are restored to your hand and all the servants are moved back into available service. You're then given a choice of three options. Hire two servants, collect 200 pounds, or refresh the builder's market for free. Afterwards, as usual, you can purchase one tile from the builder's market. Normally, you're not permitted to hire servants after passing when you're playing a solo game because that would give you an unfair advantage. But my opinion is, when you're learning the game, you need every advantage available to you. So I would say in that case, you can consider hiring two servants to be a legitimate option. And in fact, that's what we're going to do right now because I want to demonstrate how hiring works. Click the Hire Two Servants option. When you hire servants, you have to move your butler's room from your country estate to the activity box, as you see here, in order to perform the hiring action. And the butler is required to do the hiring, and the program, in my case, has automatically moved the butler on top of the butler's room tile. You'll always have your butlers available to you after you've passed, so hiring servants will always be a viable option when you pass your turn. If you're playing a solo game and you choose not to hire servants as part of your passing turn, to be fair, well then in order to hire two servants, you would need to move the butler's room to the activity box and place the butler on the tile, just as if you were hosting any other type of activity. At the start of the game, the supply board is normally stocked with two black underbutlers, a number of green valets and purple ladies' maids, each equal to the number of players in the game, and a number of footmen equal to two times the number of players in the game. You can't hire an underbutler using the hiring action of the butler's room, however. The only way you can gain an underbutler is via the butler's pantry tile, which is a tile we're going to discuss very shortly. The underbutler is a servant who can stand in for the butler, a valet, or a footman even if those servants are currently available. In fact, you can use the under butler on the butler's room to hire other servants. There are two butler's pantries in the bag, and that's why you normally stock the supply board with exactly two under butlers. But since we're playing a solo game and the AI doesn't play with servants, you only need to place one under butler on the supply board when you're playing solo. That explains why we see one under butler two valets, two ladies' maids, and four footmen in this two-player solo game. We can see that we hold three guests that require a valet. Richard Duke of Longford, Major William Hawes, and Charles Fairchild. And three guests that require a ladies' maid. Anne Harlow, 
Ann Hawkins, and Penelope Hill. Recall that we have an objective card in our hand that scores six victory points if we end the game with three ladies' maids. The question we have to ask ourselves is, would it be worth it to hire one footman and one ladies' maid now, and another footman and ladies' maid later in the game, to guarantee that we can score those six victory points? Well, I'd say that given the fact that that's the only objective tile we currently have, a known chance of scoring at the end of the game, we probably should. So let's hire one footman and one lady's maid. Those new servants will join the butler in expended service because they have to be trained to work on our country estate. Finally, we can purchase a tile from the builder's market. Do we try for the north dining room and hope the breakfast room isn't removed in hopes of achieving that Epicurean objective card that required a breakfast room and north dining room? Or do we pay 400 pounds to get the butler's pantry from the service tile reserve and a free under butler and hope that neither the north dining room nor the breakfast room is removed from the market? Oh, by the way, the servants hall is a service tile that lets you send one servant to expended service during step two of your turn in order to steal one step of reputation from another player. Since we're playing a solo game, that tile is of absolutely no benefit to us. In addition to the two servants halls in the game, there are two gossip guest cards that allow you to attack another player and have them reduce their reputation by one or two steps. You can choose to play with or without these negative tiles and cards as you see fit when you play a regular non-solo game of Obsession. It comes down to whether or not you like negative interaction in your gameplay. Anyway, I think going for the butler's pantry is our best option. So we're going to pay £400 to add the butler's pantry to our estate, which is worth one additional victory point, and we'll immediately gain an under butler who will also be sent to expended service for training. Double-click the butler's pantry now to purchase it from the service tile reserve. And the under will automatically appear in expended service along with the butler, the new lady's maid, and the new footman that we just hired. Our bank balance now stands at £500. Lastly, since we use the butler's room to hire servants, that tile is now flipped to its rose side and returned to the country estate. Whereas the butler's room was originally worth zero victory points, it's now worth one victory point on the rose side. And if we use it again, we can choose to either hire two servants from the supply, or we could steal one valet, one lady's maid, or one footman from another player. Of course, that's not an option when you're playing a solo game, and you may decide to play the Care Bear version of Obsession and not allow stealing of, ser of servants from other players. That's entirely your choice. But if you do allow stealing of servants from other players, you can never steal a butler or a housekeeper or an underbutler. They're very loyal and refuse to leave their place of employ. All right, it's time for the AI to remove a tile at random. Click Enter. A 14 is rolled and the Lionheart Suite leaves the Builder's Market. So we still have the chance of getting the North Dining Room and the Breakfast Room. Remember that I said we'd be dealt another two objective cards at the start of Round 6? Well, it's Round 6 and two more objective cards were just added to our hand. An 11 pointer that requires the flower room and any one garden tile, and another objective that scores one victory point for every prestige guest we own at the end of the game. Fortunately, we don't have to decide right now which to discard, and we won't have to until the next courtship. So click the hand button to hide the objective cards for now and restore your hand of cards. 
I think we should now immediately reuse the main gazebo or bowling green so that we can pair up Charles Fairchild with Lady Margaret Carlo and get our family reputation up to two. Between the main gazebo and the bowling green, I think we should play the main gazebo and hope for a good choice of casual guests. Just as before, the main gazebo requires a footman, so drag your footman from available service onto the tile. Choose to invite Charles Fairchild and Lady Margaret. Charles requires a valet, so drag one from available service onto his card. In summary, we are going to first gain a total of five reputation from Charles and Lady Margaret. That's going to shift our reputation wheel by one full revolution and will increase our reputation from 1.1 to 2.1 and finally we'll have a family reputation of two. Secondly, we'll draw one casual guest from the top of the casual guest tech for Lady Margaret's other favor. And lastly, we'll draw two casual guests for the main gazebo and choose one to keep, discarding the other to the bottom of the casual guest deck. Click continue to proceed. There goes our reputation all the way around. Lady Margaret invited Sir Alan Fulford, a baronet who has a prestige rating of two and comes with a favor of both two reputation and 100 pounds, should we invite him to an activity. Finally, we get to choose between Francis Trotwood, a PR1 casual guest with zero victory points with favors of one reputation and one casual guest, and Lady Elise Gilmore, a PR2 casual guest, who we now can play because our family reputation has grown to two. She's worth one victory point with a favor of two reputation, and I think Lady Elise Skillmore is the clear winner between those two, so click her to add her to your hand. Francis Trotwood will go to the bottom of the casual guest deck. There's Lady Elise all the way over in the far right. Well, we have 500 pounds to spend at the builder's market. Considering that our family reputation now stands at two, I think we should pay 500 pounds for the breakfast room, a tile we can play in the upcoming round. Notice that the first monument, Sculpture Gardens, has also appeared in the 800 pound slot, but it costs a monumental 1,200 pounds to purchase. Monuments are tiles with high victory point values. Notice this one has a victory point value of 10. They also provide one reputation during step two of every non-courtship term. Remember that I said I would discuss step two of the order of play? Well, it's in that step that you check for special round events such as the village fair or the objective card draw. And it's also in that step that you resolve the servants hall for any player that owns one. And lastly, it's the step when all players gain one reputation for every monument they own. The game obsession comes with some reminder tokens. You can put a reminder token on your reputation wheel to remind yourself that you need to get, say, one reputation because you own one monument. Well, we're going to buy the breakfast room for 500 pounds, so go ahead and click that. Recall that when a monument is in the builder's market, the AI uses a different table to determine which tiles to steal from the market. The AI will take the first available monument and score the victory points for it at the end of the game should it roll a result of 1 to 7. Click End Turn and let's see what happens. It rolls a 5 and takes the monument. That's worth 10 victory points to it at the end of the game. It's now round 7. The second courtship is going to occur next round. We want to host the breakfast room since we now have a family reputation of 2. Go ahead and click it. 
That tile requires a housekeeper in attendance and four gentry invited to breakfast. So drag the red housekeeper to the tile. Since our family reputation is now a two, we have a larger selection of guests we can potentially invite. We need money and we need reputation just as much. If we want to buy that north dining room at the end of the round, in order to satisfy that nine point objective card we hold, we're going to need to have 300 pounds on hand to spend. If we do buy the North Dining Room for purposes of the courtship, we'll be ahead by two points in essentials once we flip the breakfast room. We'll be ahead by two in service, tied in estate, nine points behind in prestige, and tied in sporting. That's a 40% chance of winning the second courtship and a 40% chance of tying. Anyhow, go ahead and close the builder's market. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that we really should try to resolve the front parlor in round nine, which is the next and last occurrence of the village fair, by the way. To do that, we'll need the housekeeper and at least one lady's maid available. Therefore, I think we should invite three gentlemen and one lady to this breakfast and save a lady's maid for round nine. So with that in mind, let's invite Theodore the father for his 200 pounds. Alan Fulford for his two reputation and 100 pounds. William Hawes for his two reputation. And Lady Elise Gilmore for her two reputation. Because we own the servant's quarters tile, we can use the servant's quarters special ability and take a valet out of servant's quarters and we'll put it on Alan Fulford. William Hawes also needs a valet, but we have the brushing room tile, so we can use a footman in available service to satisfy his needs. We need a lady's maid for Lady Elise Gilmore. For favors, we should expect to receive 200 pounds from the father and 100 pounds from Alan for a total of 300 pounds. Then we're going to receive a total of 2 plus 2 plus 2 or 6 reputation, which will give us another much needed boost to our reputation, resulting in a new high of 3.2. Click continue to earn these favors. As planned, we're going to pay 300 pounds for the North Dining Room. Go ahead and click it. Our balance now stands at zero. Click and turn. The, the AI rolls a four and takes the green room from the builder's market. Well, it's time for the second courtship, and in a moment, Charles is going to leave our discard pile and return to the round track to join Elizabeth and the theme card for the second courtship will be drawn. And it is... Estate again. It's a tie, meaning we gain a victory point card, and so does the AI. We were dealt a free servant victory point card worth five victory points at the end of the game if we don't redeem it. But because the courtship was a tie, we don't get to add a fair child to our hand. Furthermore, the AI gets a victory point card, and to be fair, we shouldn't flip it over. We should only find out what it is at the end of the game. Once again, we have to discard an objective card. The odds of fulfilling that 17-pointer are dwindling, so let's drop that one, the third objective card that we hold. It's about to be round nine, and another village fair is coming up. Click continue to proceed. There's our two reputation and much needed 300 pounds. Incidentally, it's also time to set up the PR1 tile reserve, but there are no tiles in the builder's market with a prestige rating of one, so there's still nothing in the prestige rating one tile reserve. As planned, 
Let's finally host Whist in the front parlor. We can use the servant's quarters ability once again to retrieve the housekeeper and drag it on top of the front parlor. We have to invite two ladies, and we only have one lady's maid available, so let's invite the mother, Mabel, who doesn't require service, along with, hmm, well, we probably should check out the builder's market so we have an idea of how much money we might want to spend. So click the builder's market button to take a peek. Well, the queen suite would be an excellent choice, especially considering the fact that the estate theme card has already been used twice for both courtships so far, and the estate victory points will be totaled up at the end of the game for that final courtship. The queen suite also converts into a monument once it's flipped. The only problem is we don't have a prestige guest to invite to the queen suite and it costs 400 pounds and we only have 300 pounds. We'll have to deal with that problem later on. For now, close the builder's market. We could invite Penelope Hill along with the mother and hope we get a PR3 or PR4 prestige guest that we could invite at some point. We would then have to use another special action to get the extra 100 pounds needed to purchase the queen suite. Let's do that. We're going to invite Penelope Hill along with Mabel. Penelope needs a lady's maid. The activity tile will provide us with three reputation. Click continue. Well, great. The prestige guest is Count Dmitri Konstantinov with a prestige rating of three. For the mother, let's use her dismiss favor to dump Anne Hawkins once and for all so we don't have to worry about her negative three victory points. Now we'll use a special action and trade in two of the three reputation we just gained for 100 pounds. We're going to right click on our balance of 300 pounds spend two reputation falling back to a family reputation of three but having 400 pounds now to procure the queen suite click the queen suite to remove it from the builders market it's time for the ai to roll a die the roll is 17 and nothing happens Next round, the die result will be reduced by 5. For round 10, let's host a pheasant hunt in the hillside kennels. The tile requires a footman, and we're going to have to invite three gentry. Let's bring a footman down onto the hillside kennels. For those three gentry, we have no choice. It has to be the son, Anne Harlow, and Count Dimitri. Richard, Duke of Longford, with his prestige rating of 6, is still way out of reach. The Count needs a valet. And Dan Harlow needs a lady's maid. For Edward's favor, we're going to take one reputation to get us back into family reputation 4 territory. The tile will pay us 300 pounds and Lady Anne will pay us an additional 100 pounds for a total of 400 and we'll get a casual guest and a prestige guest from the count. Click continue. Choose one reputation for Edward. The casual guest is Lady Mary Russell. She's okay. And the prestige guest is Hazel Viscountess Cross, who would be an outstanding guest for the Queen Suite. Unfortunately, Hazel, she only has one leg, the poor thing, and therefore needs the assistance of two ladies' maids. Fortunately, we have two ladies' maids in attendance. We could buy the smoking room, but I'm a little tempted not to buy anything this round and save up for the Great Hall. Let's do that and hope it isn't stolen by the AI. By the way, the South Lawn over here, 
That's another example of a hybrid tile. All right, we're going to click cancel and not buy a tile from the builder's market. And we're going to click end turn and see what the AI rolls. It rolled an 18, which remember is adjusted down by 5, which equals 13, and therefore it took the English garden. And take a look. When the builder's market had to be refilled, the writing stables was drawn. That's a tile with a prestige rating of 1, and therefore was moved into the PR1 tile reserve. And another tile was then drawn, the tennis court, which now occupies the 800 pound slot. If we click on the button for the round track, we can see that round 11 is when the builder's holiday occurs. When it's the builder's holiday, you can buy more than one tile from the builder's market, if you can afford it. More importantly, I think we should pay attention to round 14, the national holiday. It's still three rounds away, but that's a much more important holiday in my opinion, and we'll talk more about it later. We're probably going to have to pass in round 13 to prepare for that national holiday. And the national holiday is the reason I thought we should save up for the Great Hall. However, we're still short the money. If we invite Hazel into the Queen Suite, we could double her 100 pound favor and make it 200 pounds. But it would be a shame to give up a doubled favor of six reputation, especially since we only have four rounds to make it to a family reputation of seven, which is what you want to achieve for endgame scoring. So I think we should double the reputation favor and then spend two of the six to perform a special action to get the extra money we need to buy the Great Hall. So let's choose the Queen Suite. We'll invite Hazel to spend a night there. The housekeeper needs to be put on the queen suite. And Hazel needs two ladies' maids, one from available service and one using the servants' quarters special ability. You can see just how valuable that servants' quarters tile can be. I think we've already used it three or four times already. So as you can see, the Queen Suite allows us to double one favor of the prestige guests that we invite to this affair. Click Continue. We're going to double the three reputation favor and take six reputation instead. We gain 100 pounds and six reputation. Then we're going to trade two of that six reputation for 100 pounds, which is going to drop our family reputation back to four. We're going to right click on the 500 and make it 600. Reputation is now at 4.5. But with that 600 pounds, we're going to scoop up the Great Hall. That's all we can afford at this point, even though it's the builder's holiday. So we're going to click Cancel. The big plus is that the Queen Suite is now a monument and will pay us one reputation every round for the rest of the game. That's three reputation in rounds 13, 14, and 15. Hopefully we can score a huge amount of reputation during the national holiday and get our reputation much closer to seven. Remember, if you're using the board game pieces, get a reminder token and put it on your reputation wheel so you don't forget to take that one reputation every round from now on. Again, not counting courtship rounds. Okay, let's click end turn and let the AI make a choice. It rolled a four. And the smoking room was taken. Well, I have no problem with that. I did hear a sound, however. Let's take a look at the builder's market. Some more service tiles have been added to the service tile reserve stack. The barn, another brushing room, another butler's pantry, in addition to that servant's hall that was already there. It's now time for the third courtship. 
We're ahead in essentials and service and sporting, but we're behind in estate and prestige. But since we've already seen the only two estate theme cards that were in the theme deck, there's no chance of a third one being drawn, and therefore we have a 75% chance of winning this courtship and a 25% chance of losing it. Those are darn good odds. Click continue. Sporting, we win the courtship. Six to five. We get a VP card, and we're going to choose to take Elizabeth this time for her prestige guest. We really need to get more prestige guests in our deck. Well, once again, we have to discard an objective. As attractive as that 12-pointer is, the odds of fulfilling it are pretty small. I think that's the one we should discard. Click the first objective card to discard it. We just automatically gained one reputation for the Queen Suite, and our family reputation is back at five. With the national holiday coming up next round, we're going to pass in preparation so that we have all the guests we need to invite. Once again, we're going to hire two servants, a footman and a lady's maid. We have no money to buy this round, so we're not going to make a purchase. We can click Cancel. It's the AI's turn. Click End Turn. Oh, another monument is in the Builder's Market, and it takes it with a roll of three. That is five more victory points for the AI, and now it's time for the National Holiday. The National Holiday lets you ignore prestige ratings on tiles and cards, and therefore you can host any tile and invite any guest, regardless of your reputation. Also, in Step 2, another reputation was added for the Queen Suite, so now we're up to 5.2. We're going to host a grand ball in the Great Hall with a prestige rating of 6, which we can only play because it's the National Holiday. Instead of putting the butler on the tile, we're going to use the under butler. Remember, he can fill in for the butler. We also have to invite six gentry to this party. We'll start with that great guest, the prestige rating six, Duke of Longford. He's all the way over to the right. Click the black bar to scroll to the right until you find the Duke of Longford. There he is at the end. Click him to invite him. He gets moved to the front of the hand so we don't lose track of him. We're going to pair him up with Lady Margaret Carlo so that we can get her admirer bonus of two reputation. So when combined, those two guests alone pay us 600 pounds, two reputation, one casual guest, and a VP card. Elizabeth Fairchild is definitely on the invitation list. Let's invite her. She's good for two reputation and one prestige guest. That's three down and three to go. But before we go any further, let's give the Duke his valet. And let's give Elizabeth her lady's maid. Let's invite Alan Fulford for his 100 pounds and two reputation. He gets a footman assigned to him. Next up is Hazel by Countess Cross. Hazel, where are you? Probably off to the right. There you are. We'll assign her a lady's maid. And remember, the housekeeper can stand in as a lady's maid if you're out. So we're going to have the housekeeper help Hazel as well. We need one more guest. Let's invite Penelope Hill. There she is. She's going to give us another prestige guest. She needs a lady's maid. We can take it from servants' quarters. The payoff here is going to be just as grand as the ball. 
I think we're looking at 800 pounds between these three guests, nine reputation, two here, two here, two here, three here. That's going to take us to a reputation of 7.1, which is exactly where we're going to want to be. We're going to receive two prestige guests, one thanks to Elizabeth and another thanks to Penelope Hill. We'll get a casual guest thanks to Lady Margaret, and we'll get a VP card thanks to the Duke of Longford. And the grand ball itself is going to flip and be worth six victory points. Let's click continue and, and enjoy ourselves. Well, unfortunately, the casual guest is Roger Viscount Benton, a cad. He's going to cost us two victory points at the end of the game. We're going to have to rely on Mabel to kick him off the grounds if possible. The prestige guests were of Peter Viscount Townsend and Carolyn Viscountess Abernathy. We do need Mabel to get rid of Roger Viscount Benton. Hmm, that means the South Lawn would be an ideal choice since it requires two ladies. Let's buy the South Lawn for 400 pounds. Its 300 pound payoff is practically going to pay for the tile itself. Time for the AI's turn. Click End Turn. It rolls an 18 and doesn't remove a tile. Once again, the roll will be adjusted downward by 5 next round. And now it's round 15, the last round before the final courtship. We're hosting archery on the south lawn. That requires a footman. We'll invite Mabel and Lady Elise Gilmore. Where are you? Right there. She needs a lady's maid from servants' quarters. Click Continue. We gain 300 pounds and two reputation. And for Mabel, we're going to dismiss Roger Benton. So I'm going to click Dismiss 1. And to make this easy, I'm going to click on V here to sort all the cards from lowest to highest by victory points. That puts Roger Venton at the front of the pack, and we're going to dismiss him, get rid of his minus two victory points. Our reputation stands at 7.4, but a reputation of 7.4 gets the same victory points at the end of the game that a reputation of 7.2 does, so it's worth it to us to use a special action to trade into reputation for 100 pounds because you score one victory point for every 200 pounds rounded down at the end of the game. So I'm going to right click on the 700 pounds here, reduce our reputation to 7.2, and increase our balance to 800. While I'm at it, I should tell you that the maximum reputation in a standard game of obsession is 7.5. If you're going to host an activity that might cause you to exceed a reputation of 7.5, before you host the activity, you should first use special actions to reduce your reputation to an amount that would result in you ending up with a reputation of 7.1 or 7.2. And that reminds me of another important rule I want to share with you. As long as you meet the requirements of an activity, you can spend any number of special actions and still host that activity even if your reputation falls below the tile's prestige rating. For example, let's say our prestige rating was 6.1 and we were hosting the Great Hall in a normal round. We need the reputation of 6 in order to play the Great Hall at all because it has a prestige rating of 6. But let's say we ended up being short one servant and we needed to refresh a servant from servants' quarters to available service in order to make it all work. So we perform a special action and we spend three reputation to refresh that servant. 
Well, even though our reputation has now fallen to 5.3 from 6.1, we can still host the Great Hall because we met its prestige rating requirement before we took any special actions. That's the key point to take away from that example. As long as you meet the requirements of an activity, you can spend any number of special actions and still host the activity even if your reputation falls below the tile's prestige rating. Anyway, is it worth spending any money now to purchase a tile? Keep in mind you score one victory point for every 200 pounds, so it's not worth it to spend two victory points worth of money to buy a tile that you can't flip that only scores one victory point. Oh, but the barn and the service tile reserve would be a perfect purchase. The barn costs 300 less 100 or 200 pounds an amount which is equivalent to one victory point at the end of the game, but the barn itself is worth two victory points, so you come out ahead. Therefore, we're going to pay 200 pounds for the barn, so double-click it. Notice that our green south lawn flipped to its red side when it moved back to the country estate, and now it's in the estate column. Unfortunately, we're still one victory point short in that column for purposes of the final courtship. It's the AI's turn again. Click End Turn. It's going to adjust its die down by 5. It rolls a 4, adjust it to 1, and then removes the North Library from the Builder's Market. Well, remember that the three previous courtships resulted in two estate theme cards and one sporting theme card. We're down in three columns. Estate, Prestige, and Sporting. So our grand total going into the final courtship is 8 plus 8 for Estate, plus 6 for Sporting, for a total of 22 points. If we compare that to the Simpsons, they get 9 plus 9 plus 11 for a total of 29 points. So going into the last courtship, we're already seven victory points down. But if the final courtship happens to be essentials, where we're ahead by eight, we can make up the difference and win the courtship in a photo finish by a nose. Click Continue, and the final theme card is... Essentials. What do you know? We win the courtship in a squeaker, 30 to 29. The program automatically adds Charles to our hand because either Fairchild will add eight victory points to our final score, so it doesn't matter who we get at this point. One last objective card to discard. Well, we never did see a flower room, so we'll discard the third one. And we easily win with a score of 159 to 96 for the AI. The AI's final score is equal to the score on its card, which is 78, plus any points it earned for VP cards. Remember, it got that one VP card for the tied courtship in the second season, so it appears that it scored three points for that. So its final score was 78 plus 3, or 81, but if you want a real challenge, you add in its points for the monuments that are acquired. 10 points for the Sculpture Garden, and 5 points for the Trophy Room, I can't remember, I think it was. But even with those monument points added, its final score comes to a paltry 96. But then again, the Simpsons is the easiest solo opponent to play against, so we did have an advantage there. Our score is equal to the victory points on all face-up tiles, whether they be positive or negative. That total came to 30. We then add all the victory points from gentry cards, including your family members. Again, adding both positive and negative points, it doesn't matter whether the card's in your hand or the discard pile. Our gentry card total came to 36 points. We scored all three of our objective cards, which added 6, 9, and 6 for a total of 21 points to our score. Because our family reputation at the end of the game was 7, we scored 28 points. 
If your final family reputation is only 6, you would only score 21 points. For a family reputation of 5, you would score 15. For 4, you would score 10. For 3, you would score 6. For 2, you would score 3. And for 1, you would score 1. But if you end the game with a reputation of 1, 2, or 3, you need to think about what you're doing wrong. That's why I wanted to get our reputation up to 7 by the end of the game for that 28-point bonus. You also score 2 victory points for every servant you end up with. Well, we ended up with 10 servants worth 20 victory points. But remember, we sort of cheated and hired during passing turns, which is not entirely fair when playing solo. Next, you score one victory point for every 200 pounds rounded down. Our balance was 600 at the end of the game. That's worth three victory points. And finally, you add in the victory points for VP cards you didn't redeem. And that provided us with another whopping 21 points, getting us to our total of 159. If you're playing with the board game pieces and want to compare the victory points on improvement tiles and gentry cards, you can see the list right here. And that brings this very long but thorough tutorial to a close. For those of you who stuck with me through the entire process, I admire your fortitude. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments or ask on the Obsession Forum. There are loads of people there, plus an incredibly devoted designer who would be more than happy to answer every question you have. Again, look in the show notes for links to other videos and a link that shows you how to set up a game of Obsession. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.